Welcome to the Weather Modification History Hour at weathermodificationhistory.com. My name is Jim Lee from climateviewer.com, climateviewer.org. And today we're going to talk about an introduction to weather warfare and geophysical manipulation, climate engineering, and the nefarious uses of it by militaries from around the world. Um, I hope that this is going to be a very educational video. We're going to go through a lot of material quickly. And all of this material is available at weathermodificationhistory.com. Now, all of my work is free, of course. We do this for the love of it, for trying to spread the truth in a sea full of FUD and fear porn. Um, facts are facts, and these are the best you're going to find. I hope you will continue to support me at climate, or excuse me, patreon.com slash climate viewer. Um, this Patreon is, you know, my only source of income for doing this, and I do appreciate each and every one of you who support me while doing that. So at weathermodificationhistory.com, you're going to find, uh, references galore this is the place you go whenever you have hit the end of the rabbit hole and you feel like you landed in a bunch of rabbit poop so to get your way out we try to focus mainly on history and those who forget the past are doomed to repeat it so the main purpose here is for you to understand that geophysical warfare is a thing um, that weather warfare is a distinct possibility and it is going on today. So to arm you with all the facts, um, we put this page together. Um, I work with a friend of mine. His name is Dominic Marama. Um, I will be answering questions at the end of this live broadcast. If you guys would like to get in on that, just use the hashtag WXMOD or WXMOD which is military jargon for weather modification. And I think that's appropriate given the topic today. So the topic of weather warfare is something not, you know, understood by the masses, let alone the fact that weather modification is a huge thing. And you can come over here to our news vault. It's available at newspapers at the top and see, you know, news from 1800 to present, um, just list after list after list of images um, uh, from popular mechanics, popular science, you know, newspapers around the world that document the history of weather modification. But our focus tonight is on environmental modification and weather warfare. So I do hope that you guys will um, also check out my Environmental Modification Accountability Act, which pertains directly to what we're talking about tonight. Um, this is a solution to this weather warfare problem that we have, and it's an act to end atmospheric experimentation without notification. Lengthy history on that. It is available at climateviewer.com slash nmod. I do hope that you guys will check that out as well. Um, additionally, you can check out the geoengineering page, geoengineering weather modification exposed at climateviewer.com slash geoengineering and all of the articles, links, and the details. So we're going to start with something called the Environmental Modification Convention, or NMOD. Now, NMOD um, is a weather warfare ban. This ban occurred in the 70s. I was born in 1976, and you know I went most of my life without knowing that weather modification was even a thing, let alone that weather warfare had been banned in uh, 1977. And most people to this day do not know this. I find that highly ironic given all of the discussion online about chemtrails and weather warfare. So I start from this place. It was originally called the Convention on Prohibition of Military or Other Hostile Use of Environmental Modification Techniques. Thank God they shortened that down to the Environmental Modification Convention. But this NMOD treaty basically prohibits effectively military or any other hostile use of environmental modification techniques. Um, and you can see that here. And the language goes like this. Each, st each state party to this convention undertakes not to engage in military or any other hostile use 
of environmental modification techniques which having long, widespread, long-lasting, or severe effects as a means of destruction, damage, or injury to any other state party. Any technique for changing through the deliberate manipulation of natural processes, the dynamics, composition, or structure of the Earth, including its biota, lithosphere, hydrosphere, and atmosphere, or outer space. This convention shall not hinder the use of environmental modification techniques for peaceful purposes. So at the end of the day, this, this uh, ban only bans hostile military weather warfare having l widespread and long-lasting or severe effects. Not a big thing until you start really looking into the history of it. Why was this thing passed? Well, it has something to do with something called Operation Popeye or Weather Warfare over Vietnam. We're going to get into that as well, and there's a whole lot of references down here. But you can come to the bottom and you can actually see um, the original documentation on this. Uh, you know, the links are provided above. Of course, we have some photos to go along with it. But this is the Environmental Modification Treaty hearing before the Committee on Foreign Relations, United States Senate. And uh, the big long name for it, October 3rd, 1978. Here's a UN version of that. And this is a real thing. And these are the people that signed that agreement. Parties to the treaty are in green. People who only signed it but were like, whatevs are in yellow. And red countries didn't sign it because... Generally speaking, most of these red countries don't really engage in weather modification at all. Oh, wait, they do now, but that was 1978. So there we go on that. So what we're going to do tonight is we're going to go through the tags. Um, basically, if you come down here to the sidebar, you're going to see a section called Environmental Warfare. And if you click on this, it'll take you over to a list of all of the, the stuff on um, weather modification history related to weather warfare specifically. And what you're going to see is things, and I start this out, I could start this out at any point, but I started right here because I found it, you know, poignant. President Kennedy, United Nations Address on Weather Modification. If the Soviets control space, they can control Earth. As in past centuries, the nation that controlled the seas dominated the continents. To this end, we shall urge, and urge proposals extending the United Nations Charter to the limits of man's exploration of the universe, reserving outer space for peaceful purposes, and... We shall propose further cooperative efforts between all nations in weather prediction and eventually in weather control. Now, John F. Kennedy, you know, said this in front of the United Nations in 1961. Um, shortly thereafter, Lyndon B. Johnson, at a, uh, it's a college commencement speech, said something similar and his uh quote good lay is the predicate and the foundation for the development of a weather satellite that will permit man to determine the world's cloud layer and ultimately to control the weather and he who controls the weather will control the world that will permit man to determine the world's cloud layer and he who controls the weather will control the world now we originally had this up on youtube and both the john f kennedy and the lyndon johnson thing got flagged down almost immediately when i put it in my article 10 most uh 10 technologies to own the weather today so, of course, Harold Say, being a gentleman, backed that video up and made it available for us anyway. So, he who controls the weather controls the world. President Johnson. Now we're getting kind of creepy. So, back to this uh, list. We're moving along now. There was the Partial Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, and this was a result of the United States military literally and the Russians trying to blow up the ionosphere. They were doing space weather modification. 
So as a result, um, they discovered something called the Christophilos effect, and this was that trapped radiation from these nuclear blasts would bounce from pole to pole, and oh my god, that could be used as a weapon. We could turn the ionosphere into a bug zapper and fry ICBMs or intercontinental, intercontinental ballistic missiles um, you know, that are flying through space. And if uh, that's a possibility, well, maybe we should work on that. So that was exactly what they did um, for the next 60 years. And in a separate section, you can go to space weather modification and ionospheric heaters and sounding rockets and see all those articles on here. Um, but we're going to focus on this environmental modification, environmental warfare section right now. Um, now we're to the big one. Uh, this is the one most people know about. It's Operation Popeye. Now, Operation Popeye, when it happened, it was almost immediately renamed. And the reason why is because hero Jack Anderson, right there, saw Lyndon Johnson's desk a uh, note. And that note said, continue Operation Popeye weather modification over Laos. And this nosy reporter, Jack Anderson, went and got in touch with Senator Claiborne Pell. And Senator Pell had three separate hearings, um, two of which are available on weather modification history. The third is classified to this day. Um, and they basically found that, you know, the United States military, the U.S. Air Force, U.S. Navy, led by Henry Kissinger and the CIA did weather warfare over Laos and Vietnam um, for the better part of five, six years, and nobody knew it. And uh, this is one of the original articles uh, right here. Weather War Outcry, uh, this is 1972. The weather as a weapon of war, cloud seeding over Vietnam, U.S. turns rain into war weapon. This is back when there was actual news. Um, we didn't have all the fake news that we deal with today. Um, CIA rain making over Laos has only indifferent results. Um, okay, that's focusing on the fact that they sucked at it, but let's not let's not split hairs here. The Central Intelligence Agency has tried rainmaking over the Ho Chi Minh Trail of southern Laos, but only with indifferent results, military sources report. The CIA declined to comment on the report. A derp. So this is part of the Pentagon Papers originally. And the list just goes on and on with these articles. Rainmaking over trail tried by CIA in 1972. Um... Senator seeks senator to seek NATO ban on weather wars. That's what led to this environmental modification convention. That's because we kept this a secret because Henry Kissinger did not even tell the Secretary of Defense that they were doing weather or warfare. Melvin Laird, when he was called in front of Congress, he he was clueless. He was like, I don't think we ever did weather modification over Vietnam. That's because Henry Kissinger globalist trilateral Bilderberger New World Order CFR stalwart um, you know basically did all this in secret and he did it in such a way that only three to five planes were even involved during the whole process and the base commanders in Vietnam didn't even know what those flights were um, doing so I find that highly ironic, um, especially in today's modern society where they say, oh, for a chemtrail, you know, conspiracy to occur, everybody would have to be in on it. It'd have to be, you know, everybody would know. Well, we did weather warfare over Vietnam and nobody knew until Jack Anderson saw that note and raised hell. So none of this would be public were it not for a diligent reporter with a, you know, being nosy. U.S. urges ban on weather manipulative warfare. Um, U.S. Soviets propose ban on weather war. Oh my goodness, now the Soviets are like, you know what, maybe this is a bad idea. Um, this could go really badly for us. Maybe we're next. So suddenly everybody was agreeing that, you know, towards environmental warfare, probably not a good idea. Um, maybe we should ban all of this. Um, and, you know, we've got some video later. here 
won't play that probably get a copyright strike on this thing um, but regardless watch the videos and you can see my presentation at the end on that so operation popeye when jack anderson made it public the military of course immediately renamed it to operation motor pool then they called it operation intermediary and compatriot but they're all the same thing this is weather warfare over vietnam now between this Vietnam debacle and uh, the weather warfare ban, there was something called the solar powered satellite or weather controlled death ray, as I like to call it. And I could have gone on at length quoting all of this stuff down here. You guys can uh, definitely read through it. Um, fascinating stuff to say the least, but this is my favorite quote. As long as the program was called solar energy by the United States, it could not be considered a weapons project. Keep that in mind when you go, uh, go listening to, you know, the talk of solar powered satellites and how the Japanese just launched one, um, because this is a death ray of monumental proportions. And they even in, had a little chart in here and they're like this. Well, you see, Variations in refractive index lead to beam wandering, spreading, and Doppler shift, which could lead to beam control instability, which could cause ground heating and soil moisture evapor evaporation, which could cause weather modification, which will certainly cause climate modification. And here's their picture of a rectenna that's not exactly a rectangle, but Oh, I think we all know what a rectenna is. It's called HARP. It's a rectangular antenna or a phased array. Um, basically, the idea is simple. You put solar panels in space, you collect that energy, and you shoot a beam down to the ground and collect it on the ground. The only problem is this beam is going to heat the atmosphere, heat the ground, cause weather modification, and could, put, could potentially burn up an entire freaking town uh just like that val kilmer uh movie my science project <laughs> real stuff every uh every piece of fiction you watch on tv is based a little bit in reality so now we're on to the next page um let's go here and we're going to scroll to the bottom because i'm trying to start backwards so then we have CIA Project Nile Blue Rain Embargo on Cuban Crops. Now this happened simultaneous to what was going on in Vietnam, but still to this day very few people know about it. Um, but the seeding near Cuba was to cause less rain, not more. Now that's fascinating. It was supposed to squeeze rain out of clouds before they reached the island. You might say we tried to embargo rain clouds. Once again, Henry Kissinger and the CIA, up to no good, talking about destabilizing other countries through crop warfare, through making all their rain go away before they could ever reach the, the, you know, the crops that desperately needed it. And of course, here are two references on that as well. Did the CIA order weather modification to ruin the Cuban sugar crop in 69 and 70, or didn't it? Moving over here, another CIA plot, Cuban crop, San Francisco Examiner, June 27, 1976, two years before the weather warfare ban. Somehow this didn't really come up in all that. Um, but the focus was mainly on Operation Papa. Back to the list. So as a result, we actually had laws passed in America called the Weather Modification Reporting Act of 1972. Because basically, now that there were senators and congressmen figuring out that weather warfare was a thing, they're like, wait a minute, we do weather modification? <laughs> I mean, this is a thing? So Public Law 92-205 uh, was passed, and it's uh, maintaining records and submitting reports on weather modification activities that you must submit some forms to NOAA. I have pictures of these forms down here. Pictures go like this. This is NOAA week, weather modification activities to be reported to commerce uh, in 1972. Then a couple months later, proposed weather modification reporting regulations published. And finally, weather modification activities now must be reported to NOAA in the United States of America. 
Here is the forms that you fill out. You put in what you're going to do, where you're going to do it, size of the area, location, and all that. And you follow it up with a final report where you say things like months, days, number of days that you were actually doing it. What were you doing? Were you trying to increase rainfall, alleviate hail or fog, or other? like kill people um i'm sure nobody ever wrote that in that check box hours of apparatus operation by type airborne or ground and they mean are you doing cloud seeding from planes or are you doing it from the ground um and then you know what did you use silver iodide carbon dioxide or co2 or dry ice urea Ooh, that's fertilizer that's pee pee hmm creepy sodium chloride that's salt and other just Make up your weather modification uh, chemical of choice and check that box. So that's how we got here. Um, weather, the Weather Modification Reporting Act of 1972, which was followed up by, and I've got a couple articles in here, too many trying to do something about the weather. U.S. urges ban on weather manipulative warfare. That was followed up by the National Weather Modification Policy Act of 1976. Now, what this basically said was, hey, we're a Congress and we don't know crap about what's going on. And we would like to know, you know, everything that has gone on up to today and a full report must be, you know, filed and we want it back. More on that report in just a minute. So this policy act basically said, look, you know, to authorize and direct the Secretary of Commerce to develop a national policy on weather modification and for other purposes. Be it enacted by the Senate that, and House of Representatives of the United States that this site may be cited as the National Weather Modification Policy Act of 1976. So then we have our NMOD ban. So this policy act shortly after we banned weather warfare came up here. Now you've probably seen this on many chemtrail websites, weather modification, programs, problems, policy, and potential. This was a full disclosure scoping report on all weather modification activities in the United States. This report was required by that policy act we just went over and you can read the links here. Um, great copy of it on archive.org. Also over here on some colleges and I've got a copy of it on my script. Um, but there's the cover of that bad boy and that was dated May 3rd, 1979. It is like 700 and something pages. So if you want to know everything that happened up to that point, it's pretty much in there. Pretty much. We all know there's still secrets. So this is why history repeats itself because we're in a situation now where we've come full circle. People barely know that weather modification is a thing. Congress no longer reports everything going on. Um, you can get those NOAA reports. I have them mapped on Climate Viewer 3D. Um, you just simply come over to climateviewer.org. And while you're there, click on uh, Climate Viewer Maps and click on Geoengineering, and you can see those NOAA reports uh, simply by clicking like this. And these are the government reports on weather modification. In fact, you can click on the little information detail here and see that there is a Google Fusion table associated with that, which I created back in like 2012, or, uh, and I last edited it in 2015. But you can actually see who's paying for it. These are the filled out reports. So things like the state of Nevada paid Desert Research Institute to do snowpack augmentation or make it snow on top of mountains. And they did that from January through April of 2004. Now this is just the 2004 section right here. Things like Telluride Ski and Golf Company because ski resorts love weather modification, they need snow, paid western weather consultants to do snowpack augmentation, um, and the list goes on and on. So Sacramento Municipal Utility District, yada yada. These are government reports in America on who is owning your weather today. And you can see all of those mapped out in 3D on climateviewer.org. So 
up to this point, you know, that's all we got out of it. We got a weather warfare ban worldwide, and we've got a couple reporting laws in America. But if you go to weathermodificationhistory.com and you go to this section right here, and you see that there's a laws section, people, patents, programs, and laws. In the laws section, what you're going to quickly realize is that many states have exemptions to those reporting laws. So they don't have to tell us that they're mo modifying the weather. Um, and you can bet your uh, bottom dollar that the military certainly will not be reporting that either. Which brings us back to the list. So what, what happens next? Um, right here, 1989, International Treaties and Active Experiments in Space. This was a U.S. military document from the Space Physics Division Geophysical, Geophysics Laboratory at Hanscom Air Force Base, Maine. And this is when we straight got into heart. This is when we got into ionospheric heaters. This is when they decided... You know, um, there might be a small issue with this NMOD treaty. And they say great care must be exerted so that they produce no widespread or long-lasting or severe effects. That is the exact language from NMOD. So we can do space weather modification and modify the electrical currents of the entire planet for purposes like the Christophilos effect, which were discovered during prior to the limited test ban treaty. This bug zapper in the sky of creating air glow to such an extreme that they can fry satellites and ICBMs. Um, Tesla would have been tickled pink about this one. And an ability to reduce trap radiation would increase orbit selection options for future space-based surveillance systems. So that's called radiation belt remediation or sucking radiation out of the sky so that they can put spy satellites in low Earth orbit without them getting fried by a whole bunch of nuclear radiation or effects of a solar flare. So space weather modification you know, really began in earnest in the 50s with the sounding rocket experiments. But again, that's in the Star Wars section. If you'd like to click here, it'll take you all through that, and you can have that journey. Um, which brings us to, this was in September 1989. We're now only a couple months later, and here we are inventing HARP, Department of Defense HARP Steering Group, Joint Services Program, Pictures go like this. Here's a, the Air Force Geophysics Lab that wrote the last paper you just wrote, I just showed, and the Office of Naval Research for the Navy, February 1990. Hey, high frequency active auroral research program, and they did this at the workshop on ionospheric modification and generation of ELF waves or extremely low frequency waves because these have a tremendous effect on you know weather uh, terrestrially. You know, what goes up must come down, and whenever you affect weather in the ionosphere, it will affect uh, weather in the troposphere is where we, we hang out, so to speak. Um, and, you know, you can look through their whole timeline here of how the Department of Defense, DARPA, and um, the rest of the company, you know, planned on making a, an ionosphere heater specifically for space weather modification. Then they go on to list... As of 1990, all of the other ionospheric heaters around the, the globe, like Dushan Bay, Sura, Gorky, Mancher, Manchagorsk, um, Arecibo, Puerto Rico. At the time, there was one um, operating. We'll show that in just a second. Um, but it got blown over in a hurricane, and then they rebuilt it. So now there's a new improved one ionospheric heater at Arecibo, Fairbanks, Alaska, and Platteville has closed. This was the high-pass facility or the high-powered uh, auroral stimulation <laughs> um, device. High-pass was moved from Platteville up to Fairbanks, Alaska, and then closed as well. And Tromso, Norway at 1.2 million watts is one of the the second most powerful ionospheric heaters on the planet, it is still in operation today. Um, most people don't know about that one either. So this all came from the Department of Defense wanting to do space weather modification and, and be sure not to 
to screw with my Don't do long lasting or severe effects. Let's just, you know, focus on boiling the sky five minutes at a time. Maybe we'll go an hour. I mean, what's your definition of long lasting or severe? But the only difference between that, what they're doing, and what um, would be an in mod violation is if we're at war. Um, and if we're at war, there's no reason to cut that thing off. There's nobody going to stop them, and we'll deal with the repercussions later. So with Russia, China, and America possessing the technology to do these space weather modifications, that's a great concern. So now we're going to get to some meat and potatoes stuff you don't see anywhere else. Still not reported around the net. Don't understand it. But this is an actual Freedom of Information Act request. FOIA, and these were done by the sunshineproject.org, which has been deleted from the internet. I recovered this from archive.org, um, and you can see the links to that right here, web.archive.org, www.sunshine-project.org, and the original carbon black PDF here. But what this thing says is, non-lethal warfare proposal. So according to the United States military, if they do weather warfare, as long as it's considered non-lethal, everything's legit, right? Too legit to quit. We can just call it non-lethal. We can plan, you know, how much it's going to cost. And this was done at the Naval Warfare Center at China Lake, California. China Lake, California invented this cloud seeding bomb that was used in Operation Popeye. And China Lake, California is still the U.S. Navy's center for weather warfare. So if you live in California, go visit China Lake and ask them all about their weather warfare and they'll be glad to talk about it. Not. Um, but this FOIA in 1994 shows that they want to impede or deny the movement of personnel and material because of rains, floods, snow, blizzards, etc., and to disrupt economy due to the effects of floods, drought, etc. Operation Popeye, the slogan was, Make Mud, Not War. That is point number one that they're making here. Point number two, to cause floods and droughts. That's what they did in CIA with the Cuban um, sugar crops to make droughts. So how is this any different? The history is repeating itself. Even though weather warfare is banned, you are currently looking at a real life FOIA from the United States Navy that says point one and two, we're going to do Operation Popeye and uh, Project Nile Blue, the Cuban seeding over, um, you know, the sugar crops again. Hey, it's a great idea. We'll just call it non-lethal warfare. Wonderful. So that's our first FOIA. And there are more to come. So we're going to scroll back down here. I'm going to go to my next page. And of course I'm doing this all the way backwards because I want to keep this chronological. But normally you would follow this from the latest to the end. So here's our next FOIA. This one's up from the United States Air Force because you know they got to get in on it. Hey man, if the Navy and the Air Force shake hands and make an ionospheric heater called HARP, you know that they're also at it with the weather warfare stuff when it comes to cloud seeding. So what's their cloud seeding of choice? Carbon black dust, something I talk a whole lot about. And carbon black dust is a weather weapon of choice, as you will see very clearly in just a moment. And the reason why is because solar heating of carbon dust could be deployed on theater scale greater than 100 to 300 kilometers to achieve precipitation enhancement to create cirrus clouds. Chemtrails. And to dissipate fog and low clouds. Nice picture of the FOIA right here. So the title of this FOIA, Weather Modification Using Carbon Black, proposed by Phillips Laboratory Geophysics Directorate. And that is at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Wright-Patterson Air Force Base to this day is, let's do this, weather. I'm going to just do this one live. Modification, corporate roster. NASIC DECA. 
And we're going to see this. This is the Weather Modification Association at weathermodification.org. Drop the link in chat. And what we will see is that the United States military is a member of that. And it is right here. NASIC DECA, attention, Gregory T. Marks, 4180 Watson Way, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Coinky dink? I think not. So if the United States Air Force is still a member of the Weather Modification Association, if you're seeing FOIAs from them talking about carbon black dust seeding for increased precipitation, muddy dirt roads, decreased precipitation, dry out roads and fields, same thing we just heard in the Navy FOIA. Both of these are dated 1994. And that is interesting because that's when things got real, real sun. So these two FOIAs, and then they lay it out right here, project plans. Let's do some numerical modeling in 1996. Engineering and designing of test engine modification, 1997. Also, coincidentally, the year, the first year the word chemtrails ever appeared on the internet. Ground-based field trials completed by 99. Airborne test and evaluation of prototypes by 2001. Engineering design of airborne carbon black delivery system completed by 2003. Operational capability by 2004. I want you to remember these dates because it's going to come up in just a second and you're going to be pinching yourself. So this is a United States Air Force Freedom of Information Act request. This is the best evidence you got right now of active engagement of the U.S. military, both Navy and um, Air Force, doing exactly what happened before. Killing crops, making mud. Big surprise, not to me. Now this one's new, new to me. I just got this one. And shout out to the Black Vault for having this FOIA. And this is from something that preceded the Owning the Weather in 2025 documents. Now, a lot of people have heard of Owning the Weather in 2025, which we're about to cover. But before Owning the Weather in 2025, there was Counterforce Weather Control, Spacecast 2020. So before there was an Air Force 2025 series of documents talking about weather warfare of the future and future technologies that the U.S. Air Force should follow, this paper, Counterforce Weather Control, was made top secret. And then they got a copy of it. Secret, internal, don't show people this. Counterforce Weather Control, subject problem statement. This paper proposes a counterforce weather control system with both space and ground-based segments. Carbon black dust on the ground, HARP, and solar-powered satellites in space, or sounding rockets in ELF, VLF generators, topside sounders, ionospheric heaters in space on satellites. No shit. This counterforce uh, weather control system is developed through three stages, conceptualized, hypothesized, and developed. We want to be able to bore a hole through clouds to allow unrestricted surveillance of an enemy target. We want to create an atmospheric event over an enemy airfield so as to ground all their aircraft, e.g. thick fog or a severe thunderstorm. We want to create weather patterns that obscure your military movement from the enemy. Wait, did he just say chemtrails again? They're talking about creating cirrus clouds because if you create an entire deck of clouds, satellites in space can't see you. Didn't think of that one. Most people didn't. But that's why we have weather modification history, because those who forget the past are doomed to repeat it. Now, this research you're seeing is seven years of work that I've done. So I do hope that you guys will come over to the patreon.com slash climate viewer and support my work. 
Um, it's very important that I be able to continue to do this. I'm just starting this thing out and I hope that you guys will help us grow this because these are the facts and these are facts that are undeniable. I could say this in front of Congress and every congressman in the room's mouth would hit the floor. And I do hope to be able to do that someday soon. So this was part of SpaceCast 2020. It was classified. Shout out again to the Black Vault. You can see right here. Documents, theblackvault.com, SpaceCast 2020. God bless the FOIAs. So these are realistic, um, you know, real things that are tangible that you can, you know, shake a stick at and not look silly. So now we get to the one everybody's heard of. Owning the weather as a force multiplier, owning the weather in 2025. Now this happened in 1995. So let's get this timeline straight again. We just went from three FOIAs, one SpaceCast 2020, and international treaties in space, in, in space weather modification, which led up to weather as a force multiplier, owning the weather in 2025. So to all you debunkers out there who want to say this is just a think piece, this is the video that you want to send them to shut them right up. And, of course, they go through exactly all the same technologies that we just discussed. And, lo and behold, what do we see here? Right dead center, it's staring you in the face. That is not CBD oil. That is carbon black dust. So, if you go down here to CBD, you'll see carbon black dust. And, it's got a star next to it. Technologies to be developed by the DOD. And, it shows 2005. Why is that a coincidence? Because as we just showed you over here on this U.S. Air Force paper, on this timeline, operational capability 2004 of airborne carbon black delivery systems. This is not a coincidence. This is a FOIA and this is public. And this was in owning the weather in 2025. And it shows it right there in broad daylight. Hey. We want to use carbon black dust to modify the weather. Now, I could go on at length about, you know, the other papers that people didn't read from this series. Another paper is called An Operational Analysis of Air Force 2025, an application of value-focused thinking to future air and space capabilities. I read the entire series, as you can see by these photos that I created. And you can see in here, Weather Analysis and Modification System. This is global. Next one, shrinking the bullseye, shielded base, application of neutralizers could be accomplished via aerosol dispersal in quantity sufficient to enough to form a suppression cloud or fog over affected areas or sanctuary base. So making chemtrails over a base like Area 51 so that when they roll the spy plane out that they don't want anybody to see, the satellites in space can't see what's going on on the ground. Link after link on that. Space operations through the looking glass. Global area strike system. The requir requirement for a global all weather strike capability might be met by using a different laser wavelength to burn a hole through clouds. Those clouds they just created. Smoke or aerosols using the same mirror or a different one or by employing alternative weather control techniques before striking for effect with that solar powered satellite I showed you. So this is the military going, hey, we might want to be able to burn holes through clouds as well. UAV constellations, uh, drones that provide precise control for aerosol dispersal, allow controlled suspension of airborne particles, enable weather control over localized areas, providing precise control for electromagnetic or other field generation because Creating electricity over a battlefield could really screw with your brain, let alone modify weather. Operational analysis, another paper nobody read. Attack microbots, sensor microbots. Various deployment approaches are possible, including the dispersal as an aerosol, transportation by larger platform, and full flying crawling autonomy. Mmm, autonomous beehive. Uh, you know, mothership that deploys uh, multiple smaller drones that 
deploy even smaller microbot sensor crazy stuff. So that's owning the weather in 2025. Now, this is the one paper that people usually share on Facebook, and then they got a debunker in their face going, that was just a college, the Air Force College, and they were just thinking about things. These FOIAs prove otherwise. The three I've already showed you, but we can do better than that. We certainly can. Now, this is available on climateviewer.com, and I dug this one up, and this one really hit it home for me. Because after owning the weather in 2025, Dr. Arnold A. Barnes Jr. from the U.S. Air Force Physics Lab, Dink, gave a presentation titled Session B Advanced Weapon Instrumentation Technologies, where he focused on making owning the weather in 2025 a reality. This was done at the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory. Note harp on page six. Treaty issues, the UN Convention for the Prohibition of Military or any other hostile use of the environmental modification, which went into effect October 5th, 1978, applies only to widespread and long lasting or severe environmental modifications. Local non permanent changes, such as precipitation enhancement, hail suppression, are okay. And since 1978, the official Air Force position has been that weather modification had little utility or military payoff as a weapon of war in Vietnam and Cuba. The official Air Force position needs to be reevaluated, according to Dr. Arnold A. Barnes Jr. from the U.S. Air Force Phillips Lab. He was saying this in front of a joint Army Air Force group, giving a conference, convincing them that the FOIAs you already heard about, the owning the weather in 2025. Hey, let's make this a reality because in light of the last 19 years of scientific advances, in light of the advanced weapon systems, which are more environmentally system sensitive and to prepare against technological surprise because God forbid the Russians get better at weather warfare than us. Um, and that's just the reality of this. So there you go. And you can come down here. So this is, uh, from the actual slideshow and wouldn't you know it, it all just ties a bow on it. You can't make this stuff up. Same stuff they did in operation Popeye, same stuff that was discussed, discussed in the FOIAs. Same stuff that was discussed in Spacecast 2020 and in Owning the Weather in 2025. He even says AF 2025 right here at the top. So he's literally referencing it. Treaty issues as I just read it and how the Air Force needs to be reevaluate re um, their beliefs on weather warfare and get with it. Nice picture of Harp on page six. Kind of creepy. And what do they say? Weather modification using carbon black. Why? Increase precipitation, muddy dirt roads, decrease precipitation, dry out roads or fields. Operation Popeye, Project Nile Blue, Popeye, Nile Blue, history repeating itself. Those who forget the past are doomed to repeat it. And to all those chemtrail people out there, this is your Smoking gun sheet, weather modification using carbon black, page two, increase cirrus cloud cover. Why? To depopulate the world, to spray more gallons on them? No, silly heads. To deny visual satellite or high altitude reconnaissance, to block out spy satellites, to decrease light level for nighttime operations, that one even surprised me. I was like, you know what? I did not think of that. Because what would happen if America went into Iraq and basically covered the entire sky with clouds at night and made it super dark? And then we put our little night vision goggles on and their poor butts don't have night vision goggles. Oh, we have a distinct advantage. So there's a good reason why the military would want to create cirrus clouds or what everybody refers to as chemtrails using carbon black dust or soot. 
something I talk a lot about because all the evidence points that way. Storm modification, they go into, you know, what it would take, you know, to modify a hurricane. Um, and they talk about the butterfly effect or what uh, Dr. Jim Fleming recently called the Mothra effect. Uh, see my interview with him on my NMOD page. It's pretty epic. Um, and then finally, this was written in 1997. Okay, so this slideshow you're seeing that was presented by Dr. Barnes um, to a joint Army Air Force uh, you know, group says current capabilities targeted fog dispersal, local changes in rain, cloud modification for surveillance and coverage, hole boring, punch holes in clouds, and wait for it, create, suppress, serious contrails. Ionospheric modification, because in 1997, HARP just came online and was at full power. This is not a coincidence. These are the facts. These are the best facts that I've got. They're all in one tag on weather modification history. We are in the tag environmental warfare. So let's recap real quick. Three big FOIAs, SpaceCast 2020, owning the weather in 2025, and then he presents it to a joint group of Army, Air Force people as... Guys, we got to do this. So what comes next? Secretary of Defense William Cohen warns the world at a hearing that others are engaged in an eco-type of terrorism where they can alter the climate, set off earthquakes and volcanoes remotely through the use of electromagnetic waves. This is not conspiracy TV. This is just the facts. And the facts are that he said this at the Sam Nunn Policy uh, Forum in the University of Georgia, Athens, Georgia. He said it April 28, 1997. Oh, wait, uh, how long was that after this? This was March 1997. All just too coincidental. But when you start to put things in order, you start to see the big plan. Dr. Evil's geoengineering plan from national lab to global governance. So what comes next? Geoengineering. This is where it was born. Dr. Evil is Edward Teller, the guy who invented the hydrogen bomb. August 1997. <laughs> Just a coincidence. Just, you know, April 1997. March 1997. It was a busy year, 1997. The word chemtrails was used for the first time on the internet. And all of this was going on, where people were talking about making clouds to do X, Y, and Z, which I think we've covered in detail. Um, <clears throat> but Dr. Evil's geoengineering plan was basically, uh, there's a great article by Jeff Goodall. He posted it on Rolling Stone magazine. And, of course, it was removed shortly thereafter but in it uh there's some pretty nasty stuff about geoengineering and you know things that uh dr ken caldera comes into the story here and ken caldera is probably one of the most hated individuals on the planet especially if you're talking about geoengineering because he hung out with these guys and validated their research so Edward Teller, um, Lowell Wood, and Roderick Hyde, Teller Wood and Hyde, wrote the first paper, which I'll just scroll on down here to the end, because I've got the whole article mirrored right here. Um, we'll go back to that in a second. It's too good. So the first paper was right here, Global Warming and Ice Ages, Prospects for Physics-Based Modulation of Global Change, Teller Wood and Hyde. Prepared for the submittal to the 22nd International Cemetery Seminar on Planetary Emergencies in 1997. Followed up by Long Range Weather Prediction and Prevention of Climate Catastrophes, a status report by Teller Wood and Hyde and Ken Caldera. 1999. At another Planetary Emergency Seminar. In 1999. So Ken Caldera basically came in and said, you know, the thing that these guys were saying 
I did a couple of computer models and it didn't look so bad. In fact, it looks kind of rosy. And this is that paper. This is how Ken Caldera got into the world of geoengineering in a big way, hanging out with a guy who invented the hydrogen bomb and liked to say things like, no matter how hard you try, you just can't kill 25% of the population. You can kill 75% of the globe. But no matter how hard you try, 25% of people will survive. Edward Teller, Dr. Evil. Um, and the final paper in the series, now they don't need Ken Caldera and the nerds, Active Climate Stabilization, Practical Physics-Based and Approaches to the Prevention of Climate Change, where they go into making a bunch of cirrus clouds, spraying chemicals all over the planet to cool the planet, yada, yada, yada. Um, and they followed that up with the Asilomar Conference um, in 2010. And this is the quote of the, the, the century. In other words, if the public comes to see geoengineering, as one attendee put it, a crazy idea cooked up by rich Anglo-Saxons to dominate the climate, then they will all be rightfully tarred and feathered. As for the U.S. Department of Defense, forget about it. To this group... Such involvement prompts nightmares of a new military-industrial geoengineering complex. That is exactly what it is. And they do not want to be tarred and feathered. And they will do everything they can to avoid it. But those are the facts. So this is where geoengineering came in, and then this is his quote direct from him. Human beings are like cockroaches, Wood says. Um... This is Lowell Wood with a typical black humor. Um, it's fairly easy to kill the first 10% of the population. And if you try really hard, you might even get the next 10%. But no matter what you do, you'll never get the, that last 10%. We will find a way to survive. Just super, super creepy stuff. Um, and, you know, when they asked uh, Wood about it, he said, you know, what about, you know, if you type in the word chemtrails, you'll come to sites talking about the New World Order and stuff like that. So um, Jeff Kuddle actually asked Lowell Wood about that. And what does he say? A secret government conspiracy? One of the remarkable things I've learned about working with the government is that there are no secrets. It's all out there. You just have to know where to look. And I think that after mo anybody sees this video, you'll realize that most of these secrets, they're not secret anymore, especially after tonight. And then Jeff says, no secrets, I ask? He says, well, maybe five or six. So, Henry Kissinger and the CIA did it over Vietnam. They did it over Laos. Um, they did it over Cuba. And it was a secret. And there will remain secrets. And geoengineering was, in its current form, was born in a national lab with Edward Teller, Lowell Wood, Dr. Evil, and uh, Roderick Hyde. And Ken Caldera basically signed off on all of their BS. And now you can't get away from it. Uh, they, this is the original article from Rolling Stone that was deleted. Can Dr. Evil save the world forget about a future filled with wind farms and hydrogen cars the pentagon's top weaponeer says he has a radical solution that would stop global warming now no matter how much oil we burn 2006 and boy it's taken off since then so let's go back to our little list Harnessing artificial tornadoes as an energy source, atmospheric vortex engines, steering cyclones with harp solar-powered satellites. This was Bernard Eastland, the guy who invented harp. He actually was supposed to speak at a weather modification conference and talk exactly about how to steer tornadoes using what he called the thunderstorm solar-powered satellite. I actually have a video of his uh, speech because he died before he ever made it to that conference. So Lyle Jenkins, on behalf of the late Bernard Eastland, 
Eastland Science Enterprises Corporation. Um, now, he never made it there. Here's some sc a screenshot of that thunderstorm solar-powered satellite beaming down microwave energy from a solar-powered satellite into a tornadic you know, thunderstorm and heating portions of it to steer it or destroy it. Scary stuff, but the video's right here, and you can watch it. Because uh, he died in December, and I was able to cobble together enough uh, of his, his part of the, the paper to um, define, uh, or at least get the paper out. And uh, I'm a little soft on some of the, the concepts on the plasma shield and, and that, because my background is... Uh, in engineering, aerospace engineering, I worked for NASA for uh, 38 years and, and had re retired recently. So the uh, Inter Jenkins Enterprises is kind of a, a, a small uh, organization to... Anyway, you get the picture. So Mr. Eastland died before he could make it to the... Uh, weather Modification Conference for the American Meteorological Society in 2008. As many of you probably already know, that's what I just did. I went to the 21st conference on planned and inadvertent weather modification. It's the one that happened this year. So I started learning about these weather modification conferences because of that video you just saw. And as a result, I, you know, flew down to the one in Austin, Texas. It was January 9th through the 11th, 2018. And you can see my interviews from that here where I talked to Dr. Jim Fleming. I interviewed the U.S. Naval Research Lab. Um, I interviewed Raytheon about their sensor and AWIPS and how the military is involved in every single aspect of weather prediction and what you see on the TV. Um, U University Corporation for Atmospheric Research, UCAR in Boulder, Colorado. Um, I talked to them. Dr. William R. Cotton, who was uh, in the building when they did Project Storm Fury, steering hurricanes, and he's a longtime uh, cloud seeding expert. And another cloud seeding expert, Dr. Daniel Rosenfeld from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, interviewed him. And uh, an active fellow activist, Nicoletta Florio from Be Heroic. All of this is available on my NMOD page. And you can download the presentation on that right here and flip through it and see why we're doing what we're doing today. So you can understand the problem and see we're a solution because basically this environmental modification convention that was passed in 1976 needs updating. It needs to be brought up to date before history truly does repeat itself. And we have another Operation Popeye and another, let's say, crop warfare, geoengineering, rogue geoengineering chemtrails. This is important to me. And what do we have? One last just poke right in your eye. Operational defenses through weather control in 2030. This was dated April 2009. And what do they say once again? Create localized fog or stratus cloud formations, shielding critical assets against attack from energy-based weapons in space like the solar-powered satellites. So, creating chemtrails, artificial clouds. You can jump into the artificial cloud section of weather modification history and go through that, about accidental geoengineering, how we went to the EPA, dope, dope um, jet fuel, cirrus cloud seeding, stratospheric sulfate injections with commercial aircraft, but that's a video for another hour. Point being that what we see time and time again in all of these FOIAs and all of these military documents is that we want to create cloud formations to protect us from satellites in space that can either shoot laser beams at us, microwave beams at us, or spy on us. That we want to make it darker at nighttime so that we can do nighttime operations using our night vision goggles where the poor other countries don't have them. 
that we can shield our Area 51 runway when we bring out that new UFO on the flight deck. We don't want anybody seeing that. So these are the reasons why the military are, would be involved in geoengineering, weather modification, and creating clouds. This is important. And when you start to see the history, it all starts to make perfect sense. Which leads us to the last one in the, the series on environmental warfare. CIA concern, concerned with rogue ge geoengineering. Dr. Alan Robach, a geoengineer himself, says he got a call from the CIA. And uh, they were kind of upset. And the article was titled, Chill Factor at the CIA Weather Query. This is March 2015. And he goes like this, Professor Robach said, I got a phone call from two men who said, we work as consultants for the CIA. Not a coincidence. <laughs> you know, everybody talks about the secret weather warfare programs. And they talk about evergreen air and they talk about so much bullshit, but nobody talks about the history and how it just keeps repeating itself. The CIA, and we would like to know if some other country was controlling our climate, would we know about it? And then Mr. Robach says, I told them after thinking a little bit that we probably would because if you put enough material in the atmosphere to reflect sunlight, we would be able to detect it and see the equipment that was putting it up there. Quote, at the same time, I thought they were probably also interested in if we could control somebody else's climate, could they detect it? Because history is repeating itself. The CIA is going to be involved in this. The CIA is a major funder of the National Academy's report, so that makes me really worried about who's going to be in control referring to a series of uh, climate intervention reports that just came out where basically the CIA funded the whole thing, um, $630,000 worth of stuff in there, and the CIA d basically destroyed its own uh, climate uh, office, and they said, we've moved that to another area, we're hiding all this stuff. But this is in my violation after violation. There, the intention is there. The United States military's intention is there. You know Russia and China are at it. But this is the real provable facts behind weather modification and weather warfare. So I hope that this has been an educational uh, video. I hope that uh, you guys will come over here to weathermodificationhistory.com to the environmental warfare section and check these references out because if you send this link to somebody it's more than likely going to shut them right up because these are the facts this is history and you can't argue with facts in history and when you start to see the big picture the big picture is this the military wants to make mud they want to make rain they want to be able to stop rain to destroy crops. Both of these are documented. They've happened. Operation Popeye, CIA, Nile Blue, Cuban crops. We've got FOI, three separate FOIAs saying the exact same thing. We want to stop rain to kill crops. We want to make rain slow people down. We want to make cirrus clouds to block out satellites in space that do surveillance and can shoot laser beams at us. So all of this is real. It's happening today. And those who forget the past are doomed to repeat it. So that being said, uh, guys, this is my first official weather modification history hour. I will be mirroring this on climateviewer.com and on my YouTube channel. I hope that you will continue to support my work over at patreon.com slash climateviewer. Um, if you would like to get in touch with us, of course, our email is right here at the top. It's wxmod at weathermodificationhistory.com. And at the bottom of the page, here, let me fix that real quick. At the bottom of the page, you can see the info on me and uh, Dominic. And Dominic's my right-hand man. Dominic is 
uh, you know, the guy who runs this Facebook page, um, I'm extremely busy. I got two kids, you know, and I can only do this stuff at night. And Dominic is also the one who did all the artwork to, you know, transfer these, you know, newspapers into just a single image so they could be shared so that we can get the history out there. So if you'd like to get in touch with me or Dominic, um, information is at the bottom of every page on weather modification history. I hope that you guys will come over there and leave us some comments. We are using discuss comments. Every single one of these posts has a comment section at the bottom where you can feel free to leave um, your thoughts. If there's something we missed, you know, if there are references that you did not see here, and they're in this environmental warfare section, um, holler at your boy, you know. We'll put we'll review the evidence and if it's good enough, it's gold, it's going in there. Um so check out all of the different tags that we have over here, ionospheric heating, hurricane modification, geoengineering governance, and the list goes on. Carbon black dust. Um it's it's crazy that people don't know this history. That's why we created weather modification history. Um, you know, I want this to be, you know, purely about the facts and it will continue to be for quite some time to come and as long as you guys will help us share this message out there we can change the world we can prevent the next operation popeye and the next cuban rain embargo um weather warfare is a reality history does repeat itself and those who forget the past are doomed to repeat it